Hi, everyone. Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. As many of you know, in 2014, I wrote the B Corp Handbook, How You Can Use Business as a Force for Good. I'm excited to announce that the completely revised and updated second edition of the B Corp Handbook is launching this year on April 23rd, 2019. I co-authored the new version of the book with Dr. Tiffany Jana, an internationally recognized expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. The book now provides guidance on how to dramatically enhance your company's social and environmental impact while ensuring that you center equity at every step. So please order your copy today by visiting lifteconomy.com slash book. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash book. Thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. I'm your host, Andrew Baskin. The goal of this interview series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, democratic, diverse, transparent, and whole systems approach to using business as a force for good. So for us, I'd say that there's a there's a major difference in the past 10 years in how we approach goal setting and how we approach our sense of achievement. So that 10 or 15 years ago, the environmental goals, they would be developed by the environmental department and uh, handed over to operations as a goal or developed in cooperation with the operations. But now I see a much stronger sense of integration, especially within the product teams. They know what their, what their sales goals are. They know what their goals are for developing their product line to develop products that are five to 10 years ahead of other people's products, et cetera. But they have a very strong sense also of owning uh, their social and environmental goals and knowing that they have to make more of their products with fair trade certified labor, that more of their products should be blue sign certified, that if they have any products left in their line that use virgin polyester, that they have to incorporate recycled. So I think that that's that's a critical element of goal setting and also recognizing the achievement. This is our fourth episode in a series featuring Patagonia's Vincent Stanley, where we explore Patagonia's vision, culture, strategy, and operations. Topics we'll be covering in much greater detail in our upcoming Next Economy MBA. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out lifteconomy.com slash MBA. You get 40% off if you sign up before May 15th, plus an additional 15% off with the promo code hashtag Next Economy Now. Feel free to tweet that out. So our past interview with Vincent Stanley, along with other leaders at Patagonia, including Rose Marcario, Rick Ridgway, and Phil Graves, rank as our most popular episodes, and many folks have reached out to us because they want to know more of the story behind some of the business aspects of Patagonia, in particular, their vision, culture, strategy, and operations. Hence the name Patagonia Mini MBA. In the last episode, we touched on strategy, and today my business partner Ryan Honeyman will be talking with Vincent Stanley about Patagonia's operations. One last note before we drop into that discussion. We've kept a pretty consistent format of the show for some time, and I just want to give folks a heads up that I plan to continually iterate on the format of the show in the weeks and months to come based on your feedback. So any and all input is welcome and encouraged as we really want to honor our relationship with our listeners and craft a show that's truly valuable for you. I really want each of you to think about this podcast as a two-way conversation. Your critical feedback is as welcome and encouraged as creative feedback on how we can make the show even better or even fun testimonials about what you love about Next Economy now that we can share on the show. You can always email me at andrew at lifteconomy.com. So without further ado, please enjoy Ryan Honeyman's conversation with Vincent Stanley. All right, everyone, we are back again for our fourth episode with uh, Vincent Stanley, Director of Philosophy at Patagonia. Uh, Vincent, welcome back. Good to be back. So far, as a recap, we've gone through vision, culture, and strategy at Patagonia. And now we're looking to speak a little bit about operations at Patagonia and some of the insights there. And we were joking that if we run out of time, we'll talk about what's most on our mind right now and what excites us. So we'll see if we get to, get to that or if we stay in operations. So Vincent, uh, let's talk about goals and KPIs and annual goals, et cetera. And how do you think about that at Patagonia? Well, I think that we're looking, of course, at sales and margin goals and, and uh, on-time delivery and what's our percentage of returns, all of those things were the, the conventional business measurements we're looking at. But we also have deeply baked into the company um, goals for social and environmental improvement. So the most important social goal for us these days is to increase the number of uh, clothes that are made with fair trade certified labor. And that program, which began with nine yoga styles in the fall of 2014, has now become quite substantial can't recall quite the number of factories, but we're, we're using fair trade certified labor for some of our major styles and something like half the styles in the spring season and more in the winter season are 
are are are so by workers who are getting a a bonus and they elect a committee that determines how that bonus is going to be paid whether as funds or whether as i think one one factory they elected to buy bicycles so people could get home to their kids faster it's up to them on how to use the money and that that program i think has we were surprised at how rapidly it spread and i think it did spread so rapidly because the actually the factory owners uh, got behind it seeing that how engaged their employees were by this effort and how it changed the uh, the feeling of the workplace so for us i i'd say that there's a there's a major difference in the past 10 years in how we approach goal setting and how we approach our sense of achievement so that 10 or 15 years ago the environmental goals would have belonged more to the environmental department and they were they would be developed by the environmental department and uh, handed over to operations um uh, as a goal or developed in cooperation with uh, operations but now i see mu- a much stronger sense of integration especially within the product teams that when they 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 know what their what their sales goals are they know what their goals are for developing their product line to develop products that are 5 to 10 years ahead of other people's products etc but they have a very strong sense also of owning uh their social and environmental goals and knowing that they have to make more of their products with fair trade certified labor that more of their products should be blue sign certified um that if they have any products left in their line that use virgin polyester that they have to incorporate recycled so i think that that's that's a critical element of goal setting and also recognizing the achievement and in terms of like one of the things that i was thinking about is could everything you have you make be recycled now like or is it like what's the pressure on cost versus like the sort of environmental like max environmental it could be you know like how do you how do you figure out that right balance for a product yeah um it isn't easy but i think that when we we look at a particular product and then we look at the what comparable products are sold at what price we know that we can can go over the top on setting a price and we try to avoid that because it means that the product will will not have a chance to succeed but on the other hand we also know that what we're putting into the product we're often putting in higher higher quality materials that are sometimes difficult to see when you're when it's on the sales floor um we're uh putting in effort to make sure that the workers um in the factories and also in the mills are being paid fairly and have good working conditions so it's also incumbent on us to communicate um what we're putting into the clothes that may not be readily apparent when you look at them the first time and to bring that across to the consumer i think that we do less of i think in more conventional companies they will they will look at what the they regard as the what they what everybody calls the price point um is this this level of quality in this market is this permissible without um testing it and i think that we try to test that as much as possible um not not necessarily to to charge more but to make sure that we're actually making the best product and not retreating from uh making the best product because we're making assumptions about what would people will pay got it yeah so one one of the things that that brought up is do you do customer insights for like setting the price like do you get eight people in a room and ask them type thing or like how do you figure out what that price point is that that's the right point, number i don't know how we do it anymore but i think we look at um we look at what it costs us and we look at uh, an ideal margin and then we say okay is that and then we look at comp, comps for uh, uh what other companies produce so I, i i think it's more it's done that way rather than it's certainly not done on the basis of, of going out and asking people what they'll pay because they may not know what we're producing yeah yeah and what people say and what they actually do is different too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we're not <coughs> we're not producing clothes that way. So, we we really do. I mean, tr- traditionally we look at the 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 objective margin that we think we need and um and then we look at the cost and then we see how far off we are. And we might do things like, you know, eliminate a pocket or uh, something like that, but we're we're pretty uh, sensitive to uh reducing the quality of the materials and very very sensitive to not uh uh sacrificing uh 
uh, quality and, and environmental performance in order to achieve a certain price. The other thing I think that's significant, and we talked about that a little bit before, is that we do operate with tremendous constraints. Uh, a conventional clothing company can go out and use any number of off-the-shelf fabrics um, to produce a piece of clothing, and we, we operate with only a very small number of fabrics. We know they're, they've been uh, certified okay by Blue Sign. At their, we know what mills they're made in. We, we know how they perform. We've tested them. But those constraints also force us to really know what we're working with. And by knowing what we're working with, we can often make innovations that actually make a, a significant difference in the performance of a product. When you're innovative, you have much less pressure um, uh, to produce a lower price. Because it's not a, you're not dealing with a kind of familiar expectation. When you come out with a nanoware, there's no, no set idea for what that nanoware should cost. Yeah. This is sort of a random, there's a few random questions coming up. It's like, what's the best selling piece of Patagonia clothing of all time? Is there something that is like, this is our clear best seller of all time? <laughs> well, probably, I, I think there are a few of those, but I, I think the Snap Tea, Cinchilla Snap Tea, is a product that was introduced in 1985, 87. And at the time was uh, the, most, the most highly technical piece of insulation a mountaineer could have. And now would be regarded as sportswear or as cabin wear because its uh, materials have become lighter and warmer and stretchier, et cetera. But it's still a, uh, a very popular piece. Uh, baggies are another product that have been in the line for 30 years. Uh, Stand-up shorts, not quite the seller. Better sweaters are very, very strong for us. So this, the, the snap tee is like the fleece pullover? It's yes, like a, exactly. A three-fourth three snap? Yeah, whatever. exactly, right. <laughs> That's funny, because when you said cinchilla snap tee, I was like, oh, is that a t-shirt? But Because uh, I guess yeah. it would be some sort of fleece, but it turns out I was... Yeah, it, it, was it, is, the, it is the okay. familiar piece. And is that still, like as of today, do you think that's still the best-selling well, I don't know that it's the best-selling item, but over over that thirty-year sure. period, it's been a strong seller, and it's been a, a recurrent. I mean, it's been a very strong seller the last few years. It became once again a very popular piece on college campuses. So, uh, it's had not nine lives, but about yeah. three of them. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to the performance twill jeans I'm wearing. These uh -huh. I have three pairs of these, and they're like I don't wear any other pants now. Oh, great! So All right. well, thank you. And stretchy stretchiness yeah. yeah um okay back to back to operations um so reporting um you know we kind of said to what extent is financial reporting useful um and maybe you could talk a little bit like what types of reporting you do um and then maybe we could talk about some of the standards and like uh hig index the sustainable apparel yeah. coalition etc yeah right um i think we're we're looking at all of the data than any business our size or of any size would look at in terms of our, our profitability by line or uh, our profitability by uh, sales channel. Uh, we're always looking at very complex re reports on the, on the quality of our goods. I think there are a couple of protocols that we use that we did not develop ourselves that are very useful for the company and, and most companies our size would not use. And that, that would be the, the B Corp impact assessment, uh, which is the most holistic look uh, at the company's practices because it looks at, tells us how we're doing with our employees, uh, with the communities that we're doing business in, with customers and how we're treating nature. And it's enough of a third party look at the company that we get surprises. Uh, we find out that we're not doing as well as we thought we were doing in certain areas and then uh, make an effort to do improvements. That I think the first time we took the uh, B Corp impact assessment, we were much lower on the community score than we were on others. Uh, and we, we took some steps in order to improve our performance there. Uh, the other... We, we helped start the Sustainable Apparel Coalition uh, and that in 2011, and that has grown into an organization that has about 150 members who make 40% uh, or more of all the footwear and apparel sold in uh, the world. And 
what that organization does for us is they develop something called the Hig Index that has several different modules. One module uh, looks at the environmental impact of individual factories, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, energy used, waste generated, water used. Take, took baseline measurements the first year the HIG was introduced and then takes those measurements year after year. So they're really trying for the industry as a whole to reduce that environmental, that conventional environmental impact. The second is a little more complicated, which is to the HIG index looks at different processes and materials that are and compares compares them uh, uh, in terms of their environmental and social impact. And the, the information is actually loaded, uh, loaded in the ERP systems of the, of the manufacturing companies or the brands so that designers can look at the environmental impact of one fabric versus another. And then the third uh, element, which has not yet been introduced, but which we're really looking forward to, is to have a consumer-facing index. Uh, uh, that would allow you to put your hang tag up against a pair of uh, your jeans and, uh, and get a reading on, on the environmental and social impact of those jeans, say a nine or 90 out of 100, that would be industry-wide, that standard, so you could compare it in a store to uh, the rating on any other on a, on a pair of jeans from another manufacturer. These, these, these measurements really are critical to us in terms of setting goals for reducing environmental impact and improving social performance. If we didn't have these, I don't, it would be much harder to do the work we do or to, to uh, understand exactly what we're doing and then to make the decision to make improvements. Yeah, you know, it's, we, we talked a little bit about the, the Footprint Chronicles as well. And um, I'm not sure, that's <laughs> what we were joking, I'm not sure if we've already talked about it on this one. <laughs> So for folks, can you just give a little overview of that and like what um, some of the milestones have been? Yeah. So it, it, I think it was as, as far back as 2003, we started, to other, we started to look at what other companies, much larger companies were doing, and they were producing what are called CSR reports or corporate social responsibility reports. And uh, they, were, they were using uh, a, uh, one of three or four industry standards for reporting, GRI was the gold standard at that point. Uh, SASB is SASB is is the gold standard now. And uh, I wrote up a report, and we looked at it, and we said, "No, nah, we we don't want to run this." And the reason we didn't want to run it, it was too dry, and it's not how we wanted to convey the information about what we're doing to our customers. Most of the reports, if you actually read them, they're written in fairly deadly prose, and uh, people talk about all kinds of good they you know giving to the symphony and building playgrounds and stuff like that but it, there's there's what we really wanted to focus on was what are what kind of harm do we do or how, what kind of efforts do we do to reduce our harm in relation to the products we make so what we did is we decided to create something called the footprint chronicles which is an interactive website we started with five products that were representative of the line. And we showed the path of these products all the way from the field or the oil well uh, through their manufacturing, through the, the, the manufacturing of the fabric and the sewing, and uh, took it all the way to our warehouse shelf. And we talked about, we, we, it was an interesting construct. We said, okay, um, what do we like about this product? Um, uh, what do we not like? What would we like to improve? And uh, what you know? What do we think? That was the that was the third element. And then we 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 grew this over time to represent about two hundred different products. We also printed. I think Nike had also done this before us, but we printed um, all of the factories that we use. And when we produced the Footprint Chronicles, I was expecting that customers would look at it and that NGOs would come look at it. What I was surprised to find was that it became a major internal tool. And, and I, I shouldn't have been so surprised because the, I knew when I was working on the Footprint Chronicles that I was learning um, more about how we made goods than I had ever learned in 35 years of working at the company. Just because by doing this research, I was no longer silent on the marketing and the sales side. But the same, what happened to me also happened to the employees as a whole, that they 
we be, they became everybody became smarter um, in our conversations, our discussions, our um, uh, our disagreements uh, about how to make things and, and uh, uh, how to proceed. That became sharper because people had a stronger sense of uh, what actually went into making the clothes. Yeah, and Vincent, another um, reporting piece that we haven't talked about is um, your benefit corporation legal structure and the annual benefit reports you put out. I don't think some people may know what benefit corporations are, um, you know, basically legally requiring oneself to consider more than just profits. So that's sort of like a, a broad uh, you know, statement about benefit corporations and uh, not the certification. But what Patagonia did, which I'm not sure many other benefit corporations have done, which is creating the, the specific public benefit purposes or this right yeah the specific benefit purposes in the bylaws and i was just actually looking at an old um or i, I guess it's um because I, I wanted to see if the, the those benefit purposes had changed over time but i think they're the same six that you started off with and um you know so for example for readers or listeners one percent for the planet is your first um benefit purpose so can you talk about like why that's why is it important that it's in your benefit corporation bylaws as opposed to just a statement you make externally? Well, <clears throat> we became a, a benefit corporation because we wanted to we a benefit corporation in addition to becoming a B Corp because we wanted to write our values into the business charter and articles of incorporation. We also wanted to create, uh, we wanted to articulate those values uh, in a fundamental way so that the, in the long term, the ownership of the company, um, that if, if the, the company is owned by the Chouinard Family Trust, but in the long run, if new stockholders ever come in, that they really have to honor those values that we articulated when we became a benefit corporation. And, you know, you can't really, I think you can talk about writing your values in, but you can't, you have to specify what those values are. So that's why we, we listed those six beginning with the uh, giving 1% of sales every year for environmental organizations. Yeah, and this um, the second one, I'll just go through these because it's really interesting, I think. So the second one that you put in your bylaws is build the best products, cause no unnecessary harm to planet or its inhabitants. So I guess even though you've changed your mission, you still have it in your specific right. public yeah. uh, specific purpose. Um, and one of the sub pieces of that says, um, Patagonia will rate the quality of its products with quality defined and measured by durability, multifunctionalism, and non-obsolescence on a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being least and 10 being highest quality, and consistently produce products that average a rating of 8 or better. I've heard some, isn't this called like the Yvonne, the YC standard or something like that? Or like, can you talk about that with that actually? Yeah, the YC report card. Yeah. Um, a few years back, we looked at all of the products on the line, and we said, we went back to the original chapter on uh, design and let my people go surfing. Which is very interesting because if you look at that chapter, it doesn't say, it doesn't go through a, a series of didactic statements about we believe in this or we believe in that. It really starts with, with questions. And the first question is, is it multifunctional? Uh, does the pro uh, uh, second question, does the product perform uh, well for its intended use? Is it durable? Those are the top three. And so what we did with the report card is we took, there were 19 questions and we condensed those down to 10. And, um, we, what we do right before the line becomes final, right before we commit to making it, is um, we have uh, all of the, the people concerned sit down in a room with a deck of cards. And uh, the, it's, it's, it's very important to have the right people determine the particular performance uh, of, a, of a garment in particular ways. So we don't have, it's not the marketer who determines the environmental performance, it's the environmental department is looking at it and they, they, they put down an eight, if it's an eight or a nine, if it's a nine. Um, it's not the product manager who determines whether the product performs for its intended use. It would be somebody from the team that does product testing both in the field and in the lab. So we do that every time we did that for all products the first season, and then uh, any time we redesign a product or introduce a product, we submit it to the to the same test. And, it, and overall, if it falls below a seven, we we 
usually it doesn't make it into the mine. It, often there will be a little delay, and then uh, we'll make improvements to the product so that it will meet those criteria. Yeah, so it's not the design team themselves rating it after they've designed it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or, or, the, or the product management team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I was just noticing that within this uh, build the best product, cause necessary harm, there's a note in the 2017 Benefit Corp report saying that 70,337 garments are repaired globally, of which 50,000 of those were in Reno. Is the, and Reno, Nevada is now the largest apparel repair center in North America. Right. I don't think many people know that you're the largest. Patagonia is also the largest repairing or apparel repair company in North America. Or, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's curious. You know, when we, when we came out with Common Threads and we made the argument that when you're looking at the four R's, it's not just recycle. That you really have to consider first is uh, reduce. Uh, you know, don't buy what you don't need. Um, repair what's broken. Uh, reuse or recirculate what you no longer wear, and then recycles what comes comes last in the process. And but we looked at that and we said, okay, how are we doing on repairs? And 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 the truth was that it often took six weeks or more, eight weeks or more to get a repair. If you if you brought a broken zipper, uh, a jacket with a broken zipper into the store, it it took you a long time to get that back. And and what our people were doing because they were they wanted to, the customer to be happy is rather than having the product repaired, they were just giving them a new jacket. And so what we, we, we decided, okay, let's reduce that, that, that wait time, that turnaround time on repairs. And we did. But every time we reduced it, we got a ton more, <laughs> we got a lot more clothing in uh, because the word got out. People actually do want to keep their garments. They get attached to them, particularly if they've used, you know, if you take a jacket with you on a, on a, on a trip to the Andes, you don't necessarily want to, hand it back over the counter in exchange for a new one. And uh, so we kept doubling the uh, number of, uh, of, of, of repair operators that we had in Reno to the point where we're now the largest repair facility in the North America. It's wild. And I, I don't think many people know about the part of your website where you sell used clothing. Yeah. Well, that's fairly new. Yeah. Um, and again, what we're trying to, we're actually trying to do a couple of things with that. One is to make sure that perfectly good clothes get circulated. Uh, and, and second, to some extent, because we do, people, people often ask us, okay, they say, well, you know, Patagonia is good quality, but uh, aren't you excluding a lot of the possible customer base because your prices are high? And then that becomes a circular argument. We say, well, our prices are high because we're making things to last and we're using good materials and we're paying people fairly, et cetera. But there's another, to get out of that round robin of protested excuses, you, you can say, okay, well, we do make clothes with a lot that, that have a lot of life in them for a second for a second round, and um, and that lets in a lot of people who might not be able students who might not be able to afford uh, uh, Patagonia first. So I think that that's an important program. One of the uh, the next one here that I think probably well maybe like I can count on like one hand how many companies I think do this, but sharing best practice with other companies. You say in this report, sharing proprietary information and best practices with other businesses, including direct competitors, when the board of directors determines that doing so may produce a material positive impact on the environment. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about what that means and what's, what you've done in that area? Yeah. I'll give you an example. Let's say we came up with some new material for, that offered superior performance in a, in a jacket for climb, high altitude climbing. Ordinarily, if we did that, we would we would get a uh, an exclusive on the fabric for the first couple of years uh, from the manufacturer, and we have no scruples against that. That gives gives a company a running start. But if we introduce a fabric that has a strong environmental advantage, we think it's important not to take that exclusive and and to share the fabric um, with our competitors from the beginning. We did that with Ulux, which is a, a material a plant-based material that's a substitute for neoprene, which is really environmentally harmful. And uh, when we came up with this material called Ulex, uh, the alternative, we offered it to the entire surf industry. Um, it's used in wetsuits. And I, I just noticed a, a company in Norway making uh, leashes out of it and uh, uh, windsurfing socks. Um, and, and, the, and our idea of, 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 of spreading the technology from the beginning is... It, there's also a good business motive because it, actu it actually commercializes a new fabric faster, but it also uh, 
we feel an obligation to uh, when it's environmentally beneficial to get it circulated as quickly as possible. And I remember Rose, I think I spoke with her in an interview with Rose a while back. She was saying that I think Patagonia had shared the waterless jeans technology. Yeah. With, but no one took no one took it up because they it's like so you can share it, but it's also like you gotta have well, to yeah. take it up. <laughs> yeah, they, you can share it, but they have to take it up. It took a while for people to to uh, take up Ulex. Uh, and organic cotton is exact no secret, nor did we introduce it. But uh, not many companies have uh, have uh, switched all of their cotton to organic. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, some of the other some of the other things around like uh, that in this category of workers um, that you've trained it, who were sort of not necessarily um, Patagonia workers, but with other brands around like chemical. It looks like uh, chemical management practices that are associated with the Outdoor Industry Association's Chemical Management Working Group. So it looks like a lot of cross-training with people who would theoretically be competitors to, for an environmental benefit. Yeah, and I, I think also that you know, you, the word competitor, you, uh, it's a funny word. Yes, we are competing with certain companies because we're, 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 we, want our, we want customers to buy our jacket and not buy theirs. But at the same time, there's there's a lot of cooperation. We're we're all uh, want to uh, promote responsible stewardship of public lands. We also, many of us as manufacturers, are working in the same factories and have an obligation to uh, work cooperatively to uh, reduce environmental harm in those factories. And you have to be careful because the uh, you, you you can't collude on on labor practices. But we all have an obligation separately to. Uh, ensure that labor practices are fair. So, we're, one of the things when we establish the uh, Sustainable Apparel Coalition is to, to to look at environmental standards and say, no, you know, we're not going to compete on those. We're not going to make. I'm not going to make a claim uh, that is con contests a particular claim by another manufacturer. We're not, you know we're not going to muddy the waters that way. And if we look at if we look at our environmental stewardship as pre-competitive, that this is something that we all agree to, that we uh, take off the table of, comp uh, of, of competition, and that we, uh, we agree that certain standards should be met by the whole industry. Uh, that's a tremendous, that's a, good, that's a good thing for the planet, and it's also a good thing for the customer. So what the last two uh, specific benefit, benefit purposes here, it's funny, I, I wrote a book on B Corps and I still don't know if it's like a specific benefit or a specific purpose. It's like <laughs> stuff is confusing just for folks out there <laughs> who are still are confused what difference is between B Corps and Benefit Corps. <laughs> but um, okay, so transparency, we will provide information through our website and print about the environmental impact of items across our product lines with the best science and data publicly available. Um, so how do you, how do you sort of uh, balance that transparency, be as transparent as possible when, you know, full, you know, 100% transparency isn't really possible just because of how deep your, like, just all the tiers of suppliers and, like, all the complexity. So how do you really balance that? You know, I, I don't know so much a sense of balancing. I think we, we share what we know. And, uh, I mean, you're always making judgments about what's important, but if it's, if it tends to be controversial, we will share it. Um, we, we want people to be uh, thinking seriously and making evaluations uh, about uh, products or processes that might be environmentally or, or socially harmful and, and that need to be addressed. There are a lot of things we don't know. Uh, I think Walmart at one point looked at some product that may have even been de something that's like deodorant or something and found that it, there were 400 suppliers behind it um, when you got to the various additives, the chemicals, what was in the packaging. So when we know that 80, about 85% of our environmental impact as a company is not in anything we do or even have done in the clothing factories. It's, it's in the materials. It's in the manufacture of the fabrics. And there's a lot going on behind the curtain as you go into the people who provide the various uh, elements of the fabric and then go through the dyeing processes, et cetera. But it's not a question of balancing for transparency. It's a question of, of uh, 
assessing what's important uh, about what you do know. And, and if it's something that doesn't look too good, you better put that out there. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we've actually been blessed with a, with a, a pretty good reputation uh, for our environmental and social practices. And uh, when we feel that we have something that um, needs changing, we want to be the ones that present that. I don't, we don't necessarily want somebody else to be pointing that out. And then is there ever like a, you know, cause you probably open yourself up for criticism potentially if something, yeah, something bad comes up. So how do you, how do you balance that? Or, you know, cause I think most companies are like, well, I don't want to do, I don't want to be, transparent on all this because I'll get hammered in the press or something. So how yeah. do you, how do you think about that? Well, I, I think that's a dangerous position to take that we're going to, we're going to hide something because in the age of social media, um, you know, you can have companies that have been hammered by one or two customers making a complaint or one or two NGOs pointing out uh, a problem with a, with a product or a process. So, you know, I don't think, people have the luxury to hide behind what they want to hide behind anymore. I think you, you have to presume that whatever you're doing is public um, and that you should, uh, there, there's another way to look at it too, which is, this is a very, we've talked about this before. We live in dangerous times. We live in a, we live in a, in a, in a time when the, this twin crisis, the social crisis and the environmental crisis are considerably worsening. And it's going to take all of our talents and our efforts to um, help restore communities and nature to health. And it's going to be the role of business to clean up its own act. It's also the role of business to determine what kinds of products it's going to make and whether they're actually good for uh, people on the planet. But if you're doing that, you need to, tr you need to be transparent because you need the you need the help of all your friends if you're if you're actually trying to make improvements you you want to be you want people to to know what the situation is and to be able to um, uh, to offer a hand to make the connections by people i mean i can mean people within an organization because companies that are hiding information from the outside are also hiding that information from the inside um, and also that you want to share the uh, if there's a problem, you want to you want to be able to have the help of NGOs and universities and whoever else can help you solve it. Well, last uh, question here, and last specific benefit purpose: providing a supportive work environment. Um, so it says we'll endeavor to provide a supportive work environment and high quality healthcare through things like so providing on-site daycare, subsidized childcare, and other similar items. Um, you know, one thing that was in this report that's pretty interesting is it says 80 employees participated in nonviolent civil disobedience training to yes. gain <laughs> the knowledge and resources needed to safely participate in marches and other acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. But what was that all about? Or, or can you, do you have any details on that? <laughs> yeah, well, we, uh, uh, this is an important company policy. We pay bail for somebody who's busted in a demonstration. Uh, but we, we will only do that if they've had nonviolent training. Aha. Uh -huh. So they have this pre the pre step to that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so recently we had a, a woman I worked with for, for 45 years, retired. She'd, she'd worked for about 40 years in, uh, in the child care center. And as she was negotiating her retirement package and said, well, you know, I really do, you know, I've worked this long for the company. I really do want to get my discount uh, uh, during my retirement. They said, oh, yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. And anything else? And she said, yeah, you know, I'm going to have more time on my hands. So I'd like to have the bail. <laughs> I'd like to keep the bail benefit. <laughs> so if she, uh, now that she has time on her hands and she wants to get arrested at a demonstration, she will be, the company will bail her out. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know off the top of your head how many employees have been arrested because of nonviolent civil disobedience? Uh, no, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I took the training. Yeah. Um, and uh, what's the gist? Can you give us like the, the two minute summary of nonviolent civil disobedience? Just well, I think it's controlling your temper. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, you know, uh, it's the it's in the tradition of the of the civil rights the, the non non nonviolent civil rights tradition, which is to be respectful and uh, but uh, uh, 
to, if you're in, a, in, in an illegal demonstration to go ahead and, and, and do the act and take your arrest, but uh, 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 be civil about it. Yep. And in regards to, you know, the, we talked last time about on-site childcare, you know, one of the things that came up for me is like, how do you, you know, because Patagonia is so well known for on-site childcare, but say I'm a retail employee in Palo Alto or something, you know, how do you scale benefits? Or do they get subsidized childcare at all? Or, or how do you, if you're not on-site in Ventura or, or yeah. you know? Yeah, we provide, we provide benefits who are, who are, for people who are not on-site. We just introduced childcare a couple of years ago to Reno, um, which is our, where our warehouse is. And, uh, uh, but that's the only other place where we have on-site, on-site childcare. This, this other note in the report says scaling benefits can be difficult because everyone knows pretty much that Patagonia has on-site child care. And so when so many kids want to, people want to bring their kids to work, it can put pressure on capacity and quality. So I'm, I'm curious, does that, have you seen that at all? Like sort of having to really scale up the child care services at Ventura or, or Reno because of just so much demand for the, the child care facility? Yeah. I mean, it varies. We have uh, we have baby booms, uh, and I'm sure that's not intentional, but it, it, it will happen. That we'll have uh, we'll know that in nine months we have to provide a lot more care in the in the infant room. Uh, so we can you know we can we can plan for that, um, but we haven't really compromised the care. Uh, it, it is a very um, it is a really good program, and it's a very low ratio of uh, child care providers to kids. So it's uh, it's expensive to run, but uh, I, I think it's interesting. What I see, I'm not a I'm not a father, but what I what I've seen in observing the the childcare over the over the decades is we have an interesting twin goal of producing kids who are pretty self reliant and at the same time well socialized. So you 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 have kids who are very confident about being able to interact with other kids and with grown ups. Uh, and on the other hand, you have kids with a strong sense of, of themselves. We, we have a lot of emphasis on, on uh, taking risks. Uh, you know, this is not one of the, you have a society now in which a lot of parents are afraid to practically to let their kids touch the ground because there are so many things to be, to be afraid of. And, and so navigating that and raising kids who can uh, inoculate themselves against danger rather than just avoid it uh, is really important. Yeah, the, the maybe in the last uh, ten or so minutes here, I, one of the things we had sort of dovetails with the flood of people who want to bring their kids to Patagonia is hiring generally, and we'd sort of talked about from a process standpoint, um, it, there being a lot of um, pieces in place around the, the hiring and and training to get someone up right. to speed. Can you yeah. speak to what sort of steps go through to get someone sort of up to speed at Patagonia? I think over the last few years, we've been able to uh, really improve the hiring and training process. So it's very difficult to get hired at Patagonia for, for one, we have a lot of applicants for each position. And second, if you get close to being hired, you're subjected to interviews not only with the, your, bo- your potential boss and your boss's boss, but also the people who would be working for you, the people who would be working with you, and, and often... Uh, people who aren't in your department, but that you would have regular interactions with in, in, in the job that's uh, up for grabs. So that process takes a long time, several phone interviews, and then sometimes three visits uh, to Ventura. And then the onboarding process is uh, pretty complicated. We do take people uh, climbing for an afternoon and, and, uh, and surfing. Um, uh, every new employee goes through a philosophy class with me. And it's, uh, uh, three-hour session in which we talk about primarily about what does quality mean in Patagonia and also what has been the the environmental journey what is what is the significance of environmentalism in Patagonia so the uh, and there's a there's a great deal of cross training involved and I, I think this is all all important and beneficial because you're, you're bringing people into an environment that's not conventional <clears throat> And you want people to understand not only what the written rules are, but what's what's the what are the unwritten rules? What's the what are the cultural biases? What's the what's the ethos of the company? And uh, 
I, you know, I think that the process that we have now does a good job of that. A few years ago, I, I think we brought people in too quickly and, and uh, uh, turned them loose before, uh, without really providing the kind of support that people needed to come on board. So is there, it, so it sounds like there's at least some stuff, um, some philosophy with you. Is there like sort of like, I know Zappos does a two week boot camp where everyone does the same training. Is that something you all do or, or is it really dependent on their, their job description or their <clears throat> responsibilities? No, it depends on their job. I've forgotten what the training is for retail employees, but it's, it's pretty extensive. Um, kind of in the, in the, in the, in the Zappos vein, the training for the frontline employees. But it does vary for other kinds of positions for accounting and IT and um, even for product design. Um, they'll, th- those programs will not be, it won't be a boot camp that's shared by everybody. Those, will, those programs are more tailored. Got it. You know, this is another <laughs> random question that I was thinking about is, what do you do with people who take the let my people go surfing mantra a little too much? Like they go surfing like for a whole day and like, what do you do? You know, because I know... <laughs> Yvonne brags that he has an MBA, like management by absence or something like yeah. that, right? So, like, is there, are there folks that take advantage of it? Or, like, how do you balance that when there's sort of an explicit, like, yeah, you should let people go when they want to go, go do something. But, you know, the, the people, do, do you have to reel people back in from taking, well, taking that a little too much? I was just talking about that with someone. And I was thinking back in our early days when we had very little Boy, we we didn't we were very, we weren't much on process. And I remember, <laughs> you have to understand here, we're going thirty five years back. But I remember somebody, another manager, coming to me and, and telling me that um, some employee had gotten away with eleven weeks vacation in the previous year <laughs> because nobody really checked. Uh, you know, the person was entitled to two weeks or whatever it was at the time. We're a long way from 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 those days. But I think that what's really important to create in a culture are the are the are the strong positive examples so i think part, p- partly because of, of people going surfing and partly because of daycare there's a lot of covering for your uh for your colleagues um that if somebody if the waves are good and somebody wants to be out for two or three hours you you will make sure that that person can can do that if uh, people are very good about covering for uh uh, family leave, which is uh, four months for uh, fathers as well as mothers. So there's a positive example there of 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 uh, of, of working hard, of, co- of 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 cooperating, of letting people uh, take the time they need to do their individual thing. But there's also, I think, a kind of concomitant uh, pressure, which says, "Okay, I've been I'm given this freedom, but I'm I'm I should also I am also working hard." Now there are going to be some people who who don't subscribe to that. And then it's a matter for them and their manager to have discussions. But I think it's more important rather than to, to create a culture in which slacking is not permitted. It's more important to create a culture in which all the good things are encouraged. Uh, and then I think that people tend to look at that. And they say, you know, people look at what goes on and they say, what are the real rules as opposed to uh, the rules that are written down? What do people tolerate? What, what is honored here? What will what will earn me merit or earn me the goodwill or earn me advancement in this company. And uh, the message is the, that hard work well, but also, uh, and also being cooperative, also uh, covering for people, also working with as little ego as possible and as much as possible for the common good. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I was thinking about, I didn't know if I, if I had asked earlier, I don't think I have, but around lobbying and, you know, you'd, you'd mentioned Patagonia or the child, you know, we talked about the child benefit, child care benefits. Yeah. And in the winners take all, you know, book that we spoke about, I think maybe the first session, one of the critiques on, on the author has of some companies is we have great em- employee benefits, but what are we doing to lobby or like change laws to like, and so uh-huh. yeah. I'm curious how, how you think about maybe like, you know, California has paid family leave, um, but, you know, do we need to lobby for more? Or like, I'm just kind of curious how you approach policy and lobbying and like try to get laws changed. Yeah, no, I, I, think, it, I think it is important to, uh, to advocate on issues in which you feel strongly and know something about. Um, we did testify on behalf of the family, now we're forgetting the name, but the, uh, the, the Family Act um, that provided for um, 
a, a finally a kind of minimum reprieve for uh, parents of uh, newborn kids. Um, and, of, and of course, we have testified quite extensively on behalf of environmental organizations, and then we uh, we have you know we've sued um, on behalf of uh, Bears Ears and Grand uh, Grand Staircase Escalante. You know, I think it's important to, and, and I think as we become larger, we'll probably take more public positions. And I, and I think our sense with this administration is that it's uh, very important to uh, to take public stands on the things we know about and that are um, that are important to us. Has Pat Yoni ever given to like like a, like officially as a business to political candidates? Yes. Okay. We did in the last election. Uh, we were actually prevented from doing so as a as a company, as all companies are, uh, until the Citizens uh, United decision by the Supreme Court. But in this last election, we endorsed two candidates, uh, John Tester in Montana, who was who was uh, running for re-election and had a really good uh, record on public lands issues, and then also for the uh, Democratic candidate in Nevada. Um, uh, and similarly, she had a she had a really good record, and we were uh, uh, we felt in these two cases that it was very close to very close to the bone that we these were issues we knew we knew strongly about, and we sh- we should endorse them. They both won, which was uh, gratifying. But you don't have a a, a, J, a K Street lobbying firm in Washington D.C. now that you guys have on payroll. <laughs> no, 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 we don't. <laughs> Okay, well, um, we have our, uh, the last thing on here is financial transparency. And yeah, would you speak at all about like how, what you see the responsibility of a company to be transparent or, or how you go about it at Patagonia? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting actually with, with numbers, we're, we're not very, since, since we're privately held, we're not obligated to reveal our sales figures. Uh, and uh, we don't, but it, internally, we're very transparent about the numbers and, and, and we think it's important that everybody under, that everybody in the company understand them. And uh, so, we, so we communicate them to every employee. Uh, interestingly enough, you can always find out how much Patagonia is selling because we, we're, we're very uh, upfront about <laughs> how much we give to environmental causes. So you can extrapolate, just take the, you know, that 1% figure we give you for what we give for environmental co- causes and you can figure out how much we're selling. Yeah, I have noticed that it seems like Folks I've talked to, Patagonia, are shy about saying when you, it's reached a billion dollars in sales. Yeah. <laughs> is there like a conscious, like, we don't want to talk too much about getting to a billion or something like that? Or is that just more of natural humility or something? <laughs> <laughs> it was. I mean, I, I, think, I think there are a couple of things. One is that we, we're, you, you know, we don't, we don't as a as policy, talk, talk about our sales and, and profitability. But second, I think that there's a, there's a, there was a sense in the company both Oh my gosh, we're getting to be a, a billion dollars, and that means we're that's that means we're we're a certain size that we never thought we would be. And also, there's a kind of 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 uh, uh, oh shit feeling that um, that you're really that what you do really does make a difference, um, and that at a at a certain size, it also becomes all the more important. I think we've talked about this before to to redouble your efforts to reduce your environmental footprint. Because what you have to do is, if you're growing, is you have to stay ahead of that growth. There's another factor, I think, which is maybe unique to us. I remember when we were approaching the $5 million mark and, and people saying, oh my God, we're going you know, to lose our soul. Um, we're not going to be able to be the company we were at this particular size. And I remember that at $5 million and $10 million and $50 million and $100 million and $300 million. And in each case, I think that the company kind of adjusted that, but still felt as though, I mean, not that the company, it's, the corporation has a soul, but the company has a soul. I think that the um, aggregation of, and the community of people there. So this was another, this was another milestone, like five million, fifty million, and a hundred million. And you know, how do you, how do you uh, stay true to yourself uh, when you're, uh, when you're successful in that way? Yeah, I think the the soul was called Elon. <laughs> well, I mean, it's obviously more than that, but I imagine if you had a different CEO or a different owner at each of those, it might have felt different, you know? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the, 
Uh, it's interesting when you have, I think we have about 600 people on the campus in, in, in Ventura. So there's absolutely no question that uh, Yvonne set the tone, allowed this company to, to flourish in the way it has. But he also had to be successful in allowing this culture to realize itself because he couldn't have done it on its own. On his own. It's also um, the collective work of, of all the people who work there. Well, Vincent, I think we're probably at time. Okay. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. Lyft is an impact consulting firm whose mission is to create, model, and share a locally self-reliant economy that works for the benefit of all life. To listen to all our past episodes or to share your thoughts about the show with us, visit www.lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. It's really very helpful in allowing these ideas to reach a wider audience. Once again, thanks for listening.